God allows things into our life that can be difficult and challenging and we don't understand it and we weep and we cry and I know and I faced it myself but understand that at his very core redemptively he is at work. He's winning people. He's reaching people. Romans 8.28 says he causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So whatever great calamity might come upon us, let me tell you this, that he will cause it to be used for good in my life. I know it's hard to believe when you're in the middle of it. Believe me, I know it's hard. Get your Bibles out, turn to Acts chapter 13. We're starting a new chapter. I want to begin to teach as we're plowing through the book of Acts. And you remember why we're doing this. Acts is the Pentecostal handbook. We're a Pentecostal people or we believe in the present moving of the Holy Spirit. Then the book of Acts is our handbook in understanding how that takes place. It's also an excellent book in how the church engaged the culture. And so all of these things are certainly important as we begin to go through here. And I'm just reminding you that Antioch is a Gentile church. It is distinguished from Jerusalem because that was predominantly a Jewish church. But both of these have God's purpose upon them, but each of these churches looked and functioned differently. And that might be a good place to remind everybody that most Christian churches have similar features which you would see at any church you attend. For instance, nowadays there's usually some form of lectern or pulpit. Um, There's a stage, there's some musicians usually. Um, There are things we do, there's there's preaching, there's praying, there's worshiping. Uh, Certain ordinances are practiced. And so there's there's a similarity amongst Christian churches, certainly. But that being said, churches can vary differently as well as each has a mandate, a vision, what I call flavor or DNA within its congregation. Legacy has what I've called a cultural engagement DNA. And we do, we try to, we try to be well, well balanced. Uh, I'm not saying we always do that well, but we ad- endeavor to do that. We certainly endeavor to disciple. Uh, our mobile situation provides some challenges for us. But uh, every church has a uniqueness to it. And that's, that's okay. We can be of one kingdom, but each one of us be unique in our local churches. And so, as we begin reading Acts chapter 13, we see that Antioch had some interesting DNA that we're going to see this morning. So let's begin reading. I'm going to read through verse 12 today. And this is what Luke records. It says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them. They sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elamus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. Seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. Well, that was a 
certainly a seeker sensitive moment <laughs> as he was dealing with Elamus. Anyway, it says, and immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, I mentioned to you that the church at Antioch was different. It was different because there were no built-in apostles or leadership. In fact, initially they had no leaders which had actually walked with Jesus. So what happened was they sent from Jerusalem prophets and teachers who came to Antioch to train them and to teach them. And again, I'm just sharing with you how fascinated I am that there was this, this, this little bit of apostolic influence at the beginning. Antioch had more prophetic influence because we see from this point forward that the role of the prophet is going to spring forth. In fact, later Paul will tell us in the book of Ephesians, he will tell us that it will be the apostles and the prophets linking together that will be the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so prophets are beginning to find a more notable place in the life of the early church. Now, let's get started by me sharing what I think the state of the Antioch church was. That was in the first three verses, the state of the Antioch church. There were some things that were happening at Antioch that you can begin to make the leap in application to what modern church life might look like. The first one being this, I wrote down here, diversity. Diversity. You can see instantly that different nations and races were immediately identified at Antioch. It's the first list that comes out. There were people there and they came from different locations. So there was a diversity that began to develop that honestly would be an anomaly even in the first century. It's interesting in church life that we all would say that we value and desire diversity, but achieving that end is not without its challenges, is it not? There's a gathering principle that is called, this is the official fancy name, it's called the homogeneous unit theory. Basically, you would know it as this, birds of a feather flock together. That's it. You now know what homogeneous unit means. Birds of a feather flock together. We tend to do that. We tend to group with those who have the same mindset, those who have similar experiences, those who live in the same community, those who are in like age areas. We, we, have, we have gathering tendencies that we like to be with those of whom we are like. I've had conversations through the years with people who will say things like, I need a church with more singles. Or I need a church with more couples with kids. Or I, I need a church with more newly married people. Or more widowed people. Or more seniors. There you go. I need a church like that. There you go. Why is that? Because we have, we have gathering instincts. We all tend to gather in those kinds of groups. Sometimes it's unavoidable because of a language barrier. For example, it does no one any good to go to a Spanish-speaking church or a Korean-speaking church if you're an English-speaking person. The same goes for those who do not know English. Why would they go at times to an English-speaking church when they don't understand what goes on at an English-speaking church? The Eastern Orthodox Church has made that a church gathering principle. That's why you have Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox. You have Coptic Christians, which ostensibly come from Egypt. It simply underscores the point that people gather with likenesses in mind. Now, here in America, I have mentioned that before the Civil War, the races tended to worship together. After the war, we saw the increase of predominantly black churches and white churches. Now, some of it undoubtedly, and I've already taught on this, is due to prejudice. But much of it is due to the power of common experience and common community. It's the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And so we tend to gather up with those that are most similar with us. But hear me when I say this. When the Holy Spirit is in the place, it tends to destroy those boundaries. The Holy Spirit wants to destroy those boundaries. I would personally love to see the nations represented at Legacy. We need to see a mosaic of, of people and community and culture. It's always been a hope. It's always been a dream. The hardest thing, though, is to, is to leap over 
homogeneous unit. In fact, nowadays in church marketing, they use homogeneous unit theory in order to grow their church. In other words, they say to themselves, let's market it so we can pull and use that precept in order to make ourselves grow. Well, that's a real interesting concept, except what happens is when the Holy Spirit comes, He breaks that. So the question is, do you mark it? Or do you go with the Holy Spirit? I'll just leave that to you. But this diversity was happening in Antioch. The second one that I saw just in those first three verses was the word synergy. Synergy. I'm going to define it for you. Don't, don't check out on me. Synergy. Post it, guys. Synergy is the interaction or the cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Did you get that? <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me bring it down to something else. Two can do more together than two can do separately. That's what that means. The Bible puts it this way. The Scripture says if one can put a thousand to flight, how many can two put to flight? 10,000. You know the scripture. So one puts 1,000 to flight, two, 10,000. Now that passage is a passage of synergy. Why is that? Because if one sends 1,000 to flight, then if you have another one, they'll send 1,000 to flight, right? So really, math says that one plus one, 1,000 to flight plus 1,000 to flight then if you put two together, you would think it would be 2,000, right? But when synergy is at work, that's not how it works. When one comes together with another one, instead of it being 2,000, it becomes 10,000. That is why all of us working together is more powerful than all of us working separately or individually. You can have 150 people doing individual things, and you'll have 150,000 in effect. But if you begin to see synergy at work, what happens is if one is 1,000, two is 10,000, holy moly, then, then three would have to be 100,000, four would be a million, and all of a sudden you get to 150, and then you'd have to get the number 10 and use those exponents, and I don't know, you couldn't hardly imagine. That's how God works. That's why missionaries were sent out two by two. Because together, something exponential can take place. That's why when people say, and there's some truth to it, they say, you can serve God and you don't have to be a part of a local church. Well, that's true. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't be a part of a local church, but I'm just saying you'll never reach exponential possibility unless you connect with other people. So actually, you're minimizing what God wants to maximize in your life. Then the third one here is the word I use, prophecy. There was diversity, there was synergy, and then there was prophecy. Antioch valued, understood, and knew how to handle the prophetic word and its input. Now, you know I'm not referring to end times teaching here, but rather the word of the Lord that flowed supernaturally out of a prophet into the church or into a person. There at Antioch, we begin to see that there was a seriousness to both the releasing of the word and the reception of the word. I, hey, let, me just, let me just say a couple things here. We in charismatic churches sometimes use the phrase, God spoke to me way too much. If you use the phrase, God spoke to me, I believe that is indeed possible. But don't use it for everything. Because sometimes it might not have been God. It may have been, well, it seemed like a good idea. And so we've just sort of developed the phrase, God spoke to me. Are you following me? We need to renew our seriousness with regards to how we do this. I believe in the prophetic. I believe some of you here have been graced to hear from God in, in profound and, and more consistent ways. Some of you, that's just a gifting in your life. And, 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 and it needs to be respected. It needs to be received. But all of us together need to be careful when we use the word, God spoke to me. All right? Because if God spoke to you, it should be a serious, serious matter. And so we would want that to take place, and it certainly was in Antioch. So the Holy Spirit 
is, is doing all of these things at Antioch. He's laying a foundation for their engagement with the culture. And let me remind you that cultural engagement is not as narrow as to only mean political involvement. Some people, because my face is on things at times, think somehow or another that cultural engagement means only some form of political involvement or some form of public policy debate. Listen, cultural engagement is when the truth of the gospel and the precepts of Scripture are applied to every arena of life. I believe Jesus is Lord of all. That means there is nothing outside of His scope of Lordship. There is no arena that's compartmentalized that somehow or another it's off out of bounds for the Lord. The separation of church and state, all I'll simply say is I don't want one church exercising rule over the whole nation. However, you can't cut out God from His rulership over all the nation. See, it's not separation of God and government. Jesus is Lord of all. There is no area that he's not Lord of. And that's not theory. That people said, you're wanting a theocracy. No, I don't. <laughs> well, we, we're, you know, we're living under a theocracy. It just depends on what your theos is. Right now we're living under humanism and secularism, which basically is man venerating himself to be his own God. So we have a theocracy already, and it's called man. So there's always going to be that in the life. But we apply his precepts to the media, to the marketplace, to educational arenas, to government, to sports, to entertainment, to politics, to areas of justice, injustice. Wherever, wherever something's going on, the truth of the gospel is pressed into that and Jesus is Lord of it. That's what it means to engage the culture. So when you're sharing your, your testimony with a coworker, you're engaging the culture. It's just a different, well, why don't you call it witnessing? Well, it's because we've used the word witness so much that you don't hear it anymore. You just, you hear it and it goes, it's like devotions. Do you do your devotions? So it becomes this, this powerless word. So how do you engage the culture? Well, go to your own, you know, the own water station, and when your colleagues are there, why don't you find a way to share with them the gospel, share with them your faith, share with them what God has to say about a subject they're talking about. You say, well, they, they might not like me. <laughs> Welcome to the book of Acts. <laughs> but that's our calling, isn't it? I understand it can't be done 24-7, and you have to find the right time and the right moment. I get that. But that's what it looks like. This is what it looks like for most of us. But... You know, for me, you know, for us, we're trying to get into a grade school so we can work with some public school kids. That's engaging the culture. Going to share with them the gospel. You know, sometimes, I, you know, pastor will be on talk radio or he'll have his face on some newscast or something. What are you doing? You're engaging media. You're making them think. You're, you're, you're letting the Holy Spirit use a moment to arrest their attention. All right? So I hope... I hope you're a part of that somehow, some way. In your sphere, you're engaging the culture when you share with your family. You're engaging the culture when you're walking your dog around the neighborhood and you see a neighbor and you stop for five minutes to visit with them, hoping maybe to find a divine moment that you might be able to share something with them for the kingdom because you realize you are on kingdom assignment. Your, your life is not about getting your next paycheck and just socking it away and just somehow just, you know, Going through life. You and I are on kingdom assignment. One of my assignments is to teach my church and the body, and that's a part of my assignment. But you have an assignment too. And you need to find that assignment. And you need to be about the Father's business. And I've, and I've about got an anointing coming on me right here. That's, that's what I call up in the tree and shaking it a little bit anointing. I mean, when was the last time you just shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time you just gave your testimony to someone? When was the last time you just looked someone in the eye somewhere and just said, you know, I think Jesus could really make a difference in your life? When was the last time that ever happened in you? God's not looking for you to be this analyst on Fox News. God's not looking for you to be, to be some famous preacher of all time. He had a Billy Graham. He'll raise another Billy Graham up. What he's looking is for his people to do his business where he's put them. 
Don't just navigate life thinking it's just all about you. We talk about how selfless we are and then what we, it's all about, it's all about us. Anyway, I better let that one go right there. I feel a horse pulling up and I'm about ready to ride it. Let me give you some context here. I'm moving along quickly. The context of the engagement. This is the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Number one is this. They confronted the counterfeit. They confronted the counterfeit. The whole story revolves around a proconsul by the name of Sergius Paulus. Now, what's a proconsul? A proconsul, as you'll see on the screen, is a governor of a province in the Roman Empire who was appointed by the Roman Senate for one year. In other words, he was a governmental political figure. Oh, here we go again pastors in this again now listen i'm just preaching scripture here i'm not i'm not trying to make this fit this guy was a political appointed governor that paul who is still sort of known as saul is engaging so the early church keeps engaging these leaders sergius apparently is interested in the gospel but at the same time, Sergius is apparently being counseled or influenced by a false prophet by the name of Alamus Bar-Jesus. His name literally means, Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus. Now you understand we got a problem here, don't we? <laughs> Jesus didn't have kids. But Alamus had a name that basically was son of Jesus. So Alamus is trying to keep him, Sergius, from hearing the gospel. And this is where the confrontation takes place. Now, hear me when I say this. The church has a responsibility to confront the error which is trying to influence our civil leaders. They have all sorts of counselors gathered around them. And so Paul did that. He didn't rebuke Alamus, but he did, go, or excuse me, he didn't rebuke Sergius, but he did rebuke Alamus. Honestly, I don't know if Paul's immediate response was using the son of devil technique. I don't know. I don't know if he'd been talking to him for a long time, trying to get to Sergius, and finally he was exasperated, and out of his exasperation he goes, son of the devil. I don't know. I suspect there probably was some interaction before Paul went there. I would not suggest going from zero to 100 with someone you're working with that quick. So you're talking to them around the water cooler and you're sharing your testimony and, and they go, I don't want to hear that, you son of the devil. <laughs> you probably are going to hamper your future opportunity with that. But let me just say, even as we're being cautioned in that regard, there's no doubt Paul confronted it. We as a church have to find ways to confront the forces that are seeking to influence our kids, our relationships, our public officials, our teachers. You know, right now there's such a, 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 a barrenness of understanding with regards to simple history. You got, you got people, I'm just, and I understand, I'm not here to, to pot shot public schools, I'm really not. I, I, there's, there's good people in public schools, I understand there can be good education that's taking place, but I'm just telling you, as a parent, you better be on that. And hear me when I say this, right now we have people that are coming out of an educational system that have everything backwards. It's not even the truth. We were arguing the other day over the president's remarks with regards to compare, comparing uh, the Crusades with what uh, the barbarism of ISIS, and it's going on. And people don't know what the Crusades were all about. People think in their mind that the Crusades were like <laughs> Christians one day got this wild hair in some meeting that they'd all go get their swords, run down to the Middle East, and just start killing people. That's kind of what we've been left with the opinion. They don't understand the centuries of Islamic barbarism that was pushing in to areas that was destroying their churches, killing their women, raping their women, killing their children, until finally the church arose out of its pacifism and said, no more. We have a right to defend ourselves. That's the Crusades. But, unless that's confronted, 
We're going to go on and on and on that somehow you and I are as barbaristic as what goes on in the Middle East. And that simply is a lie. So we have to confront that. We have to confront. We have to confront people who, who want to challenge our Christian bakers and Christian photographers and t-shirt printers and Hobby Lobbies and others. The people who rule need to hear the gospel. Our judges need to hear the gospel. Those we send to Columbia and Washington need to hear the gospel. Because right now, it will begin to affect what you do in liberty. I understand. If you, if you don't care, that's great. I hope you can do your thing in catacombs. Because right now, I enjoy doing life on the street. But, it, but the trajectory we're headed... Listen, we dedicated a little baby girl today, and I'm going to go down here in a few weeks, and my grandson's going to be dedicated. And I'm here to tell you, if, if we as grandparents and parents don't get on the stick, our kids and grandkids are going to grow up in an America that's blind and dark. And, and if they decide to live for Jesus, it's going to be a whole lot different than how you and I are living for Jesus and the environment we're living it in. And I, for one, am not going to have my grandson stand on my grave and look at his grandpa's name and say, what did my grandpa do in the years when all of this was being decided? Was he a coward? Was he spineless? Or did he arise and share his faith and preach the gospel? And did he live all out for Jesus? And did he do what he know, knew he needed to do in, 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 in a time period that it wasn't easy to live in? Because he's left me with a mess. So we have to confront things. Number two, there was immediate confirmation. The most fascinating part to me is that Paul prophesies over Alamus the same sign and wonder which got his attention on the road to Damascus. Isn't that fascinating? You remember what happened to Paul, don't you? God smote him off his horse and he was blind. And now all of a sudden he's prophesying over this guy and he speaks the same thing that happened to him. It's like Paul saying, you know, this is what happened to me. Now I speak it over you. Now I'm going to pick that up in just a moment. Because this goes a little deeper than just what we, what we see here. But I'm reminded that there's a, spirit, uh, a supernatural dimension to our engagement. It's good to be able to be bright enough to visit and have conversations, even at times debate with people. It, it's good to be bright enough to do that. But hear me when I say this. Paul tried to debate uh, the Greeks at the Arapagus, and then later in Corinthians, as he reflects back to that, he kicks himself because he said, I went the wrong way. I should have went in the power of God. He said, you can't, you can't win every debate, but you demonstrate the power of God or ask for God's power to show up, and, and God's power can change but a debate will never change. And we need to keep that in mind. I need to keep that in mind. I understand. There's, I, I want to I arrest people's attention, and it's easy to let them lead you down that road, but there's a moment that you've got you to kick back into that, that, that divine, um, uh, what is it, advantage that you have, which is supernatural power and how God might manifest it. And then thirdly, and I'm going to get back to this blindness stuff here, but the third thing is obviously an incredible conversion that Sergius watches all of this take place. Alamus is smote with blindness. Sergius sees what happens. And the scripture tells us that he becomes a believer. I just think that's cool. I suspect seeing your advisor counselor instantly go blind might punctuate the message you were hearing. But we see the power of God bringing people into the kingdom despite this hostile environment. So I know that we're not chasing signs and wonders, but there's a part of me that's crying out for God, the God of miracles, to again show his power. By the way, there's going to be a great statewide prayer meeting, and you can begin to mark your calendars. It's going to be in June. We think it's going to be the first week or two in June, probably on a Saturday. We'll get you those dates. I'm just trying to get you to in your mind to block off sometimes where the state of South Carolina, the church of South Carolina is going to gather in Greenville and we're going to cry out to the God of miracles. And thousands of us will come from different churches, from different nations, from different communities. There's going to be a representation, a diversity and a synergy 
and the word of the Lord in the gathering that I believe God can use that in order to move in our state. And then I'll leave you with this, just final points to ponder and I'm going to wrap up. Number one is this, not all prophecy is necessarily a good word. Now I was taught different than that. Because Paul mentioned in that 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians that public prophecy in general was for encouragement, consolation, and comfort. And I, I agree, generally I agree with that. That when there's prophecy that comes forth for the body, that it should have the spirit upon it which should bring encouragement and comfort and consolation. I absolutely believe that to be the case. But when the office of prophet shows up, I think there's a different role at times. And while I think that God always brings hope, the Lord always will speak possibility and promise, you have to understand that a lot of what the Lord did wasn't always what we might define as good. Now, He is a good God. His plans will always ultimately produce good, but good is defined in His eyes and not your eyes. So the good for this moment was that, Alamus, you go blind because I'm saving Sergius. Now, God doesn't give people an open season to prophesy death and destruction. So hear me, this is not some free thing you can do to prophesy destruction over people. But if I stand here and I look at you and I say there's a coming calamity that's about ready to overcome, I don't know that that's a great word. I mean, who's going to sign up for calamity? Who's going who's to barrel through the doors saying, oh, Pastor Baird's preaching calamity. Let's go hear that one. Nobody. I'm not, I, see, I'm not, I'm not a fool. I may look like one, but I'm really, I understand. That don't, calamity doesn't mark it as well as promise. I understand. Believe me, I get it. But even in the calamity word, there's hope. Because the hope is that his people will never be seen begging for bread. That you don't have to function in lack, though the world may be. You understand what I'm saying? So not every word is good in the sense of how you might define good. Everything may not be sunshine and roses. God sometimes speaks and says, I'm sending great judgment. Listen, God can send judgment, but if you're right with God, what have you got to worry about? It's, it's a good word to you because out of judgment, God will raise up his people. And so if he collapses a nation, I'm here to tell you that his kingdom shall arise. See? Now the second thing I just mentioned is this, and that is the Lord allowed at the very minimum or perhaps even initiated the blindness. Now this is the thing. See, this is the theology thing that I just find interesting. Perhaps like most of you, I've, I've, I've embraced in the past the notion that God never does anything bad. But, but here's my problem with that. We always define good and bad from our perspective. We never understand God's perspective. Now, I believe that God's nature, listen to me, is good. His nature's love. I believe that the cross was meant not only to redeem us from our sins, but the atonement in the blood was to free us from our sicknesses and to heal us from our diseases. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe everything that flows out of God's nature is to bring deliverance and healing and hope to people. But you can't get around the fact that at bare minimum, God allows things into our lives that get our attention. And sometimes I don't think we understand that fully. I think there are times God absolutely we, we put us in a fallen world, so obviously he allows all of that to touch us. But I think there are times God allows things. But listen, even in the challenging things, the difficult things, on what the things we may not even understand, even in all of that, he does this for redemptive purposes. I have watched too many people catch a terminal disease and it was the only thing that got their attention to say yes to Jesus. Do I think cancer came from God? No, I don't think it came from God. But I sure enough believe it came to them to get them right with God for all eternity. I do believe that. Because better they be whole for all eternity than be healed momentarily and die without Him. That isn't charismatic 101. I know that. But I don't care anymore. 
God allows things into our life that can be difficult and challenging and we don't understand it and we weep and we cry and I know and I faced it myself but understand that at his very core redemptively he is at work. He's winning people. He's reaching people. Romans 8.28 says he causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So whatever great calamity might come upon us, let me tell you this, that he will cause it to be used for good in my life. I know it's hard to believe when you're in the middle of it. Believe me, I know it's hard. But I know if I trust him, you see at that moment, if that's the moment that all the times in the good times when I said that I trusted him, whether I was lying or not. It's easy to trust him in the good times. It's when you're facing those challenging moments, can you say with a pure heart, I still trust you. Though he yet slay me, still, still I trust him. I trust him. There's something bigger than me at work here. I want to ask you a question, and I'm done. What would it take for God to get your attention? What would it take for God to get your attention? How are you engaging? Are you engaging coworkers? Are you engaging neighbors? Are you engaging people you interact in life? I mean, what's your kingdom assignment? What is it that God's asked you to do? You say, I don't know. Well, then maybe you need to be on your knees and seeking Him and finding that out and I don't know either. I can't, I can't sit here and kind of knight you to things. You know, give me a sword or I'll take Charles's guitar and I'll just touch you with it and there you are. This is what you shall do. And, what, 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 what? and, and, and here's and, and the, and the question that tags to it. What, what will it take for God to get your attention to that? You say, wow, pastor, you're on a horse today. Yeah, I'm riding it today. I know. Good news, next week I'll be a comeback from conference and I'll probably be relaxed and I'll be back to my same old lovable, huggable self. What will it take for God to get our attention? Would it take blindness? What would it take? Antioch engaged the culture. Will legacy engage the culture? Well, that's up to you. Release the fire.